Uh, I'm James Beecher. I'm research manager at Citizens Online. Citizens Online is a UK charity that's been going since the year 2000, helping organisations ensure that the digital age we now live in doesn't exclude people. And today I'm joined by my colleague, David. Hi uh, everyone. David's partnership and project manager. Um, you can find us on Twitter. We're at Citizens Online or at James D. Beecher and at David underscore Skur if you want to say anything to us there. Um, and it might be worth mentioning, you'll see these things on future slides as well, that there is a hashtag for talking about the Consumer Digital Index. Nice and simple. It's just those words, one after the other. And um, you can tag in at Lloyds Bank News as well. Before we get started, uh, as well as introducing yourselves in the chat, we're just going to um, launch a Zoom poll. My colleague David's going to launch that. Just if you can tell us a little bit about um, why you've joined us today. Okay, so I've just launched the poll, which you should all be seeing. Uh, the question is, uh, who do we have on the call? And you'll see some answers here. You've got um, five different options. I'm familiar with the Consumer Digital Index Report. I have heard of the Essential Digital Skills Framework. I work on digital transformation. I work with people who are offline or have low digital skills. And finally, I'm just interested um, in this topic. I can see 12 of you out of 20 have replied. So we're going we're gonna to run the poll for a little bit longer. You should be able to um, respond to multiple options on this, by the way. So um, tick as many as apply to you. 17 out of 20 and a couple more coming in then. Coming in. Okay, everyone's voted. So I'll end the poll, share some of those results with you. So we've got quite a nice split. Um, about a third of you already familiar with the Consumer Digital Index reports, um, also familiar with the Essential Digital Skills Framework, 30% there. Uh, about a fifth of you working on digital transformation already. Uh, half of you work with people who are offline or have low digital skills, which is great. And then uh, a few of you, three of you just interested in this issue. So hopefully there'll be something for, for everyone in this session. Um, but a nice mix there. Yeah, thanks everyone. Very briefly, uh, the problem we're trying to address with the series of um, free weekly events that we do um, is that we know that those people who are most at risk from the virus, people who are older, people who have long-term health conditions, they're also people who are among the most likely to be digitally excluded. So we've been running a, a, a series, for anyone who doesn't know, we've been running a series of these events every Thursday at 11. And you can see recordings of the previous events at citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events. I'm now going to hand over to Alex to introduce himself and tell you about the, the 2020 Consumer Digital Index report. Thanks, James. And uh, morning, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so like, like James, I'm also a, a research manager. Um, and I work for the Responsible Transformation team um, at Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, and what we do is we basically research everything to do with uh, digital exclusion this and benchmark how this is changing in the UK oh, yeah. over time. Um, we do that through a series of reports uh, called the Consumer Digital Index. Uh, you can see the front cover of the latest report that we published uh, last week, I think it was. Um, so that's there in the top left. Um, so just briefly, our sort of interpretation of digital exclusion before I get into some of the data from uh, the latest report. Um, we see it as something that happens when society is increasingly moving online, but some people are unable to follow that movement online. And that can be due to lots of different things, but the most common are a lack of digital skills, a lack of confidence, um, and then some sort of more concrete barriers like a lack of connectivity and maybe funds to get online and to, to buy devices and, and these sorts of things. So just one really basic example of, of that, um, just thinking about somebody who may never have interacted with a digital device like a smartphone or a laptop or um, a tablet or anything like that uh, at all in their lives. And now all of a sudden when they go to 
their local GP for an appointment, they're faced with a tablet that they need to interact with to indicate their arrival and to sort of register for their appointment. So that, that might seem like a really simple and obvious thing, but that, that is at its core what it is. And as more and more aspects of daily life um, head that way, there, are, there is an increasing um, large group of people who are unable to kind of make that, that change like everyone else can. Um, so digital exclusion, uh, I was saying this is something we measure in the report and we measure it using two um, distinct but complementary methods, if you like. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, essential digital skills and I'll get onto that in a second. And that, um, some of you I think have already heard of that from looking at the poll. Um, that is a sort of self-reported um, framework for measuring this. So that's survey based. That's people telling us if they can or can't do um, a range of skills. And then the other way uh, which we measure it, um, which I'll come on to a little bit later on in, this, uh, in the slides we have here, is measured through observed behaviours. So um, we have a digital engagement index score. And what that does is it looks at people's behavioural data. So data that's collected through the way that they interact with systems and tools and um, uh, our bank in different ways um, and that gives you a picture of what people are actually doing so there's a there's a very sort of important difference between the two and one is um, biased by people's own um, thought process and whether they think they can or can't do something and one is what people are actually doing um, so hopefully you'll find that interesting and I'll get into uh, essential digital skills now on the next uh, slide James thank you um, so I just wanted to briefly cover how the Essential Digital Skills Framework works and where it came from. Um, in 2018, the tech partnership, uh, Lloyds Bank uh, Department for Education, um, gathered over 350 cross-sector inputs to establish an understanding of the important new baseline for the digital skills that UK citizens need for work and also everyday life. Um, we lead the annual measurement of this baseline and we work with Ipsos Mori, who are one of the largest uh, um, research agencies in the country um, and we translated that framework into a robust measurement that we we're able to track year on year through survey um, and that's done at a nationally representative uh, level across the UK. So on the, the, way, the way the framework works is it has three tiers. It starts from the bottom at foundation skill and here basically there are seven different essential tasks that people need to be able to do just to simply get online. Um, so there are things like turning on um, a device, logging into accounts, changing the settings to make it work for them um, and that sort of thing. On the right, you can see that this year we've measured that um, uh, an estimated 9 million people um, can't do all seven of these things. So that's 16% of the UK aged 15 plus, which is um, an awful lot of people who uh, simply couldn't do um, anything even if they wanted to. Then when people have uh, the ability to do all seven of those tasks we then ask them um, a range of tasks uh, based across five different skills which you can see in the middle uh, tier of that triangle. So being safe and legal and confident online, just um, avoiding getting into trouble and avoiding losing control of your data and that sorts of things. Then communicating which is simply using um, messengers or FaceTime, being able to communicate with other people, email, that sort of thing. Problem solving, that's being able to answer your own questions by looking things up. Transacting is um, shopping online essentially, uh, and also being able to use online banking and manage your money in some basic ways. And then handling information and content is about storing the, um, your, your photos. Uh, your other content and transferring that and sending it to people and that sort of thing. So 11.7 million people, 22% um, of the UK uh, are unable to, to do these things. Um, and then lastly, if somebody is able to do foundation skill and they have the essential digital skills for life and they're also employed, then there's a similar set of questions which measure their ability to be productive and to use digital tools in the workplace. 
Um, so that might be using uh, or collaborating on a, a Word document or a PowerPoint um, with other people or checking the payslips or um, sending professional emails, that sort of thing. And that's 17.2 million people. So actually half of the workforce, over half, who aren't able to do um, some of these things. So that is the Essential Digital Skills Framework in a nutshell and some of the headline results for this year. Um, the good news is that there's 1.2 million fewer people who aren't able to do the, the basic foundation tasks like um, turning on devices. But unfortunately, that still means that there are um, about six and a half million people who can't open an app, for example, um, which is obviously quite shocking. Um, for many people, that might seem like something you, you don't have to think about the skill required to do that. But um, there's plenty of people who, for, th for them, that is just an impossible task. And that obviously excludes them from a large part of digital society today. Um, right, so that was the reported sort of self-assessment side of skills that we measure within the report. Um, now this is digital engagement and this is the bit where we use people's behavioural data to measure their actual um, levels of digital engagement. So the, the things and the frequency, the amount that they're doing online. Um, so I'll try and explain this graph uh, as simply as possible on the, the bottom there on the left. Um, along the y-axis we have the index score. Um, so this is a score of 0 to 100 which is based on 13 different variables um, and these 13 different variables uh, are across three different categories which are things like spend, so how people are transacting online, what they're, um, what they're purchasing, um, how frequently uh, they're doing these things, uh, maybe what devices they're uh, using to do so. Um, then another category is interaction. So that's how people engage with digital services and products. Um, are they using more than one device? Are they starting a task on one device and moving across to another? Um, what channels do they prefer? That sort of thing. Then the third category is technology. Um, and that uh, sort of encapsulates a few things. One, one of them is, are they engaging with um, FinTech services? Um, do they use email um, and what sorts of other devices are on their radars as well. So using that score of 0 to 100, we segment it into four groups and you can see those four groups on the graph. It uh, starts from very low, which is a score of 0 to 25, so they have very low digital engagement. Then it goes to low, high and then very high, which would be a score of 76 to 100 um, and they are the most digitally engaged in the UK. Um, this data is drawn from a sample of a million UK consumers. So we were lucky enough to have such a rich and nationally representative sample because it is such a large group of people. Um, and that gives us a sort of um, robustness of measuring what we actually want to measure. And um, the first segment there, very low, we can see that that's 33% of the UK, so one in three people um, people or adults uh, would fall into that very lowest uh, category there. Um, and actually, if you look at the very left of that graph, 7.1% um, have a score of almost zero. Um, and what that means is they are likely to be almost completely offline because they're showing no trace of digital activity. Um, and that's equivalent to 3.6 million people. Um, on the right, we've just got a few of the sort of personas that bring to life those four segments. Um, for example, the very low uh, average person um, would have scored zero on almost every measure across those 13 variables I was talking about. Uh, they might have about 5% of their total spend being online, which is um, very little and that's that's you know your average so there's many people who um, have no spend um, some of them might have a mobile phone um, but they tend not to use email or online banking and then just to go to the opposite end of the spectrum um, the very high group so 
in the segment, people uh, use online banking with a much greater frequency. They spend, they spend on average a lot more money uh, through the internet, so shopping online. Um, some of it going on online entertainment, so you know, things like streaming videos and Netflix and all that good stuff. Uh, and then um, some of them, although it's still quite rare um, at a national level, uh, are using fintech services. So, you know, things like Monzo and Yolt and different ways to um, manage money online. Um, and then one more thing just to add on that last bit is that we know that some of those demographics that um, are in that lowest group are typically older. So 77% of over 70s um, have low or no digital engagement whatsoever. Um, so it's just a specific group to call out and it might, see, it might seem like common sense, um, but it is you know, nearly eight in 10 of that age group who um, really are being left behind in terms of uh, the way that digital is progressing within society today. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, I've talked about the two different ways in which we measure digital exclusion. Um, this here, I just want to give a flavour of why um, people are digitally excluded. And I know I, I touched on that at the start, um, but this just uses a little bit of the data that we've gathered. So, um, so why are so many people less skilled and less engaged? Well, half of those who are offline say that nothing could get them online. So that's a real motivational barrier. Um, and it's the largest barrier that we um, recorded. Um, so it just shows that they have a real sort of adversity to it and they're, they're just completely switched off. So supporting that group and making them or helping them to make that leap is going to be uh, challenging and there needs to be ways to find hooks to get them excited and to see how going online could benefit elements of their life. Um, then there's another one, another barrier is cost. 53% uh, of those who are offline um, might struggle to afford broadband. So we did some research into average monthly broadband figures and it was around 30 to 35 pounds. Um, and 53% of the people in our sample um, looking at their transactional data, uh, we were not confident that they would actually be able to afford it even if um, they decided to, to try. Uh, another last barrier that I'll talk about is um, sort of cybersecurity and privacy many people are worried about the loss of control when they take their data online um, and maybe losing their, uh, you know, experiencing identity theft um, and having sort of general security concerns, um, which is an, a, a really big barrier um, and not one that's easy to resolve because things like that are, well, they do happen. Um, and it's, you know, especially if you're thinking about that older age group, it's something that they might not feel equipped to handle themselves. It can be quite scary. Um, so yeah, those are some of the main barriers. The next slide, I guess this is just, why, why do we want people to, to move online? Like what could they stand to gain from it? I just thought I'd highlight a couple of the benefits, although there are so many, you can see them in the report. Um, but firstly, like some of the sort of softer, um, less direct benefits, maybe. Um, it's maybe not the best way to put it, but um, so 87% of highly engaged uh, people say that being online helps them connect to friends and family better. Um, over half say that it helps them feel like uh, more part of their, their community. Um, we know that um, a lot of people are being able to, are, are managing their physical and mental health online. So that might be by um, ordering their prescriptions for delivery or doing some sort of meditation or uh, participating in um, support groups on Facebook and that sort of thing. Um, and then the, the next page is more of a sort of financial benefit, um, but a very important one because uh, what we found is that it's those people who um, are on a lower income or maybe more socially disadvantaged who stand the most again. So what we found was that people who had a low income but were very digital 
uh, were saving over 700 pounds a year compared to those who uh, were also on a low income but were less digital. Um, so that's a 700 pound a year saving on utility bills alone, uh, which is quite staggering. And the average um, difference between the high and low digitally engaged was about 350 pounds. Um, so yeah, obviously it's, it's a massive difference and shows that um, those in a lower socioeconomic group could potentially be saving even more. Um, so that has been most of uh, the sort of benchmarking um, data that we collect year on year and just showing you how that. But clearly um, all, that data, all that data was pre-COVID and clearly things have changed massively in the last few months. Um, and that can't be underestimated. So uh, for this report, we also decided that it was necessary to try and capture some of the more recent uh, evolutions in people's digital engagement and what's changing behaviorally, that sort of thing. And so we've done a bit of research into it as well, which you'll also find in the report. Um, and it follows that same vein where some of it is behavioral. So using the uh, using people's behavioural data to see how changes have happened over the last few months and some of it is sort of self-reported attitudinal survey data. Um, so I'll start with the behavioural stuff. On the left, the top left, there's a graph and this shows um, the proportion, the cumulative proportion of people who have been registering, registering for online banking um, from week 10 to week 17 this year versus the same uh, period last year. Um, so as you can see, there's a kind of steady upward trend up to week 12, which was the week in which um, working from home was advised. And I think lockdown came maybe that week or the week after, I'm losing track of time. But um, what you can see there is that there's a clear upward lift in that, um, in that trend line. And whilst the, the figures are small, it does show that behaviorally things have been impacted and and um, people have been um you know due to the fact that you're less able to go outside and maybe go to a branch or uh, yeah go to a branch to manage your money and um, being able to do that online has become a much bigger and um, more important thing for people um and of that group so below there's a, a contribution um bar chart and it shows those people who have been registering um, this year versus last year, what that break then looks like by age. Um, so in 2019, the, the gray color very far right, 6% um, of 70 to 79s had registered um, by week 17 in 2019. This year, that is 14% of 70 to 70, 79-year-olds. Um, so that's a massive... Um, relative jump for that age group specifically. You can see that a similar sort of thing has also happened for 60 to 69 year olds. Um, and then uh, for younger age groups, it's not really been um, affected as much. So that, that new increase in online banking is, is being driven by the older age groups. Um, and then lastly, just to end on a couple of the, the attitudinal um, data points that we've uh, pulled that um, from some um, ad hoc research and survey stuff that we did with YouGov. Um, four in five people agree that using tech has been of massive importance to them over the last uh, few months. And I think that probably goes without saying, but um, just relating that back to the fact that we've just talked about how 9 million um, people can not get online. So they won't be any of those 80 percent um so that's really just kind of shows you that the people who are online are benefiting massively from it um or that's how they feel but so many people just won't be able to tap into that benefit and then lastly a third of people more than a third of people agree that um they've used uh, tech more than usual to support their mental health and well-being um and i think that probably relates to a lot of people's experiences and the fact that um you know being able to find some sort of uh, calm moments in time when you're you're at home um stuck with other people and not able to go about your daily life uh, and also perhaps using 
using it to do some sort of exercise or workouts. Uh, those are just a couple of um, examples that show how uh, relevant it's been to people's lives recently. Um, that was uh, the end of the content I had, James. Great, thanks, Alex. So I was just going to talk a little bit briefly about the things that Citizens Online has done with this data from Lloyd's in previous years and um, picking up some things that are interesting to us, particularly from, from this year. Before I do it, it's worth um, making a brief comment on the captions that we have running. Um, we use Office 365 PowerPoint for this. Um, it's not a feature that's in Zoom. And unfortunately, that means that only the person who starts a presentation or has the slides on, on their device can, can share those um, captions in a way that actually works, really. So I'm sorry, there were some quite odd ones there for, for Alex. Um, but uh, when we upload the recording of today's session, we will add at some point eventually when we can get around to it, proper captions on the, on the YouTube video. So moving on to talk about um, how we've used Consumer Digital Index report. This is actually on the screen, some information from the 2018 report. The reports have been going on for some years. I think 2012 was maybe the first one. Um, in 2018, and I think um, shortly for 2020, there'll be some similar regional um, data available. Um, in 2018, these were particular fact sheets for each area. And we find that information really helpful because we tend to do our work with local authorities in a particular area. So it's helpful for us not just to talk about the national picture, but some of that data at a more specific local level. For instance, um, here in the Northwest, it's talking about financial um, issues, about the proportion of people who could cope for more than three months following a financial shock. So the type of shock they might be experiencing now under COVID-19. And in the Northwest, that was 2% higher at 14% than the UK average of 12% at the time. And similarly, there's information about digital that we would refer to when we're talking to local authorities about the proportion of people who um, are able to use the internet to, for instance, help them save money in that area. Um, it's also worth saying that the reports are really nice in that they include lots of case studies. The recent report does as well. Um, there's one example here. Moving on to the 2020 report, one of the things that Alex mentioned was the um, Essential Digital Skills Framework talks about transactional skills. And they're a type of skill that's particularly interesting to us because when we're talking to local councils or the organisations in their areas that are undergoing digital transformation, they want to know that people are able to use their digital services. And so often the aspect of digital exclusion that they're most interested in is whether people are able to do that. Um, so this year, the 2020 report, and I think this is the attitudinal research, um, Alex, shows proportions of people who have been using the internet for various things and it compares it against previous years. So things like accessing local council information, around half of people have been using the internet for that buying products and services is much higher at around 80%. So that suggests that people have the skill to do these sorts of things, but might not be doing them for another reason. And then you've got things around applying for jobs, accessing universal credit, managing physical or mental health, which might also involve those same kind of skills. Now, obviously these things, not everyone needs to apply for universal credit. So they won't have been using the internet to do that if they don't need to. But again, we find these, um, these sorts of numbers interesting and, and relevant to our work. One other thing that we find really useful in the reports that enables us to do kind of more local estimates about the kinds of people who might be offline or have low digital skills are the age breakdowns in the report. These are often in the appendices, but it's well worth looking through those. So for instance, this is a, a bit from this year's report on the proportion in each age group who have that transacting skill in the essential digital skills that I mentioned. So you can see that this is higher among the lower age groups, but that among over 65s, only around half of over 65s have the transacting, transacting skills. So we can then take those proportions, apply them to the ONS estimates of the numbers of people in each age group who live in an area, and come up with an estimate, for instance, for Brent, an area that we're working at the, at the moment, that around 40,000 people in that area do not have transacting um, skills. 
which rele- which which works out as a percentage that's lower than across England, which we might want to, you know, be positive about when we're talking to people from from the local area. But we would still be highlighting that that's a significant number of people who will need who need help, and we would try and do some things to help them understand where those people are, based on those those age um, breakdowns. Here's an example of how we kind of end up presenting some of that data to a client. So this is in Ashfield, another area we're working at the moment. We might use um, the Consumer Digital Index or other sources as well to identify what proportions of people in that area don't have laptops, don't have internet access at home, don't have foundation digital skills, don't have the essential digital skills for life. That's where the the skills area is usually where we most rely on the, the Consumer Digital Index. One other thing that I think is really interesting in the report, um, and Alex has already talked about this a little bit, is the barriers to digital engagement and, and how we overcome those. And although this is a, a fairly small sample size for this particular question, it's still useful information that around a quarter of people are getting some support. Barrier that they need, need to overcome can be overcome through getting support from someone to help, whether that's people from an organization like ours or the organizations we work with or whether it's from their their friends and family so there is a way that we can we can help them on that and then obviously cheaper cost comes up for again between a fifth and a quarter and uh, the topic that we talked about last week digital accessibility um, if websites or apps were easy to understand it's also interesting that that comes up as well so we'll we'll move on to a, a some questions and answers. I'll stop sharing my screen so we can all see each other and say hello. I don't know if we've got any questions in the chat already, um, David. But... Yeah, thanks, James, and thanks, Alex. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions coming in uh, in the chat. Um, I've tried to cluster them into different themes. A um, couple around COVID nineteen, which Alex, you you hinted at in your presentation, but with motivation being sort of the main barrier that you identified in that that report. Um, how has COVID-19, the COVID-19 emergency, had an impact on, on, on sort of uh, addressing that barrier, if you like, around motivation? You mentioned some people getting um, more people using online banking, an increase in using digital for health and well-being. Did any other examples or trends come up in, in that report from, from your side? And then we can open um, it up, maybe. Yeah, th those are the main ones that uh, we looked at in the report, but I guess anecdotally, like, COVID-19 has really accelerated, um, as most people can imagine, it's really ex accelerated people's need to, to with, th have some problems to fill those with digital solutions. Because uh, for some examples, that is just the only thing that's left is solving the problem digitally. Um, so I think in terms of motivation, it's a needs-based thing. Um, so where somebody has a need that they can no longer um, fill because they can't go out or they can't um, speak to the person that they need to, that's where COVID-19 has had that impact. Um, I don't think we could say that it's a general increase in motivation because now people are real, uh, suddenly thinking, oh, actually, digital is not that bad. Um, I think it's more on a need by on a, on a needs basis, basically. Thanks, Alex. Um, I wonder if we have, have others got any other examples of how uh, motivation as a barrier now is being sort of tackled by the this COVID-19 emergency and pandemic. Um, lots of, I'm sure there's lots of anecdotal examples out there. I wonder if anyone wants to share anything um, on that topic. If you do, please, please put your hand up and um, um, unmute yourselves. Um, we've certainly found in, in Brighton and Hove um, a lot of charities having to really shift at, at real pace their services online. For instance, Grace Air Foundation working with supporting people with learning disabilities, suddenly having to create Facebook friendship groups and they've seen a 400% increase in, in uptake. So it's actually rendered their, their support service more accessible, which is a, a kind of fascinating stat. So that's just an example. Um, if, if no one wants to share anything else, we can move on to some other questions. Um, there's a mention again around COVID-19, the, the COVID-19 app rollout, which is a hot topic at the moment. Um, Phil uh, Brannigan wonders if this index would help with identifying potential issues, for example, people who cannot use apps and, 
and if this index is useful in that way and 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 maybe there are also some other resources out there that could could help um groups understand how it might be an issue for a lot of people alex yeah exactly i mean we um i highlighted earlier that 6.5 million people say themselves they don't know how to use an app and they couldn't find one and open it um so that's a group who's instantly excluded from uh this new method of um of working through COVID um, and there'll be many more examples like that so, so that's a, a large chunk of society who's going to need face-to-face um, -face contact to help them figure out how to use that and that's even if they have a device so um, we have been, we've been doing a lot of work with um, some government departments to really show to them um, um, the substantial figures uh, of people and different demographics that might not see some of the advertising, for example, that has been rolled out through Instagram and, and other channels by the government um, around COVID and how to stay safe and what not to do. There's lots of people that just won't have seen that. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a, a challenging time and it's, it's helping to accelerate people's thoughts around digital transformation and what that means for um, a large part of the a large part of society. I think, um... I think I said this on a previous call, but it's perhaps worth saying for people who, who weren't on that call that um, when this was raised um, on our Twitter the other day by someone, someone responded by saying, you know, um, not everyone needs to use that app. Um, so it may potentially not be a problem that some people are not using it, but they then went on to suggest that some of the key groups to use that app were among those that we know are the people who are least likely to be able to. So no paid workers and so on um, we also know that a lot of people just don't have smartphones so they won't be able to use the app on for that reason and i think there is a question about um the the perception of that sort of the feeling that that generates even if we don't need everyone to be using it even if it um it will provide useful information however many people are using it and it and it's and, it, and the, the way that it works doesn't rely on everyone using it if you feel that you're being excluded because you can't participate in part of the, the national effort in that way, then I, I do think that's important to, to think about how we address that. Should we move on to another question, David? Yeah, there's just one more on the, the sort of COVID-19, you know, uh, environment we're all in um, with such a question from Christine. Um, and by the way, the fir first question was from Miranda. Uh, thanks for your question, Miranda. Sorry, I forgot to mention your name. Uh, Christine asked, with such high percentage of the population who can't afford broadband um, and who are digitally disengaged, will, will this put this particular group of people, this cohort of people, more at risk from COVID? Um, so those that are higher risk of catching the virus are also those most digitally excluded. So um, does that mean that it creates a high risk for those that are um, at risk from COVID, you know, the actual action risk? Yeah, I think definitely. If, if, you're, if you're completely offline, then first of all, you're missing out on a huge part of the, the digital debate and discussion around how to stay safe. Um, where what what things not to do um a lot of the new um detail that gets rolled out by the government on a sort of weekly basis the news online i mean you can get it through tv but i think there's far more discussion generally online um and then as we just mentioned with the the new app that's coming out can't get that at all yeah so um yeah i think it could compound the the risk factors that these people have I think if, if we look at the, the data that ONS, the Office of National Statistics, have put out about um, deaths and how they have been concentrated in areas of higher deprivation and among people in terms of working age people, among occupations that are um, lower paid or um, thought of or described as being lower skilled, then we can we can quite see it, clearly see that there is some kind of impact whether that's all to do with digital or not i'm not sure but i'm sure it plays a part in it and i mean like i said right at the start we know that the people who are less likely to be off who are more likely to be offline are by and large older people that is the the single most um significant factor in um predicting whether someone's likely to be offline or have low digital skills 
and we know yeah, that those people are most at risk can. from the virus. I mean, there's two slightly separate things here because how at risk you are from the virus is difficult to understand, but we, we're, to the extent we're beginning to understand that it is to do with age and, and long-term conditions mostly. So if you're offline, but you're young and healthy and you catch the virus because you didn't get the information you could have done online, you're still not at any more risk from the virus. Um, although uh, obviously not everyone who's young and healthy is, is fine. But if you're older, you are, you're already quite at risk from the virus. Um, and so if you don't get that information, it really is, it really is quite important that you've missed out on it. Um, and like Alex said, you know, people can get this information from radio and television, but a lot of the government guidance is pretty detailed. And although the gov.uk website is very good at laying that information out simply and relatively accessibly, you really need to look at it. You need to look at particular pages to understand what to do if you're in a particular group, to understand yeah. what to do if you're if in you're... a particular situation, to, to, to access tests, things like that. Yeah. If you're, if you're receiving your information only through radio and television, you have to wait for it to come to you. Um, and if, it's, if you have access to the internet and you know, device, then you can um, receive it whenever you want to learn more or when you have a question that hasn't been answered on TV. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Should we do a few more of these, David? We're kind of at the end, so I should maybe do the wrap up. I'll try and cover as many of these, these questions that have come up when I do the wrap up. Yeah, there are a few more. Um, yeah, let's give that a go, James. I mean, there's, there's a couple, Alex, which you might be able to reply in the chat um, regarding um, the data yeah. that features in the report. Uh, is the data underpinning the report available anywhere, asks Lee. And also, uh, Paul is asking um, if, you, if there's a breakdown of the, the stats around um, accessibility um, and, you know, just a bit more where, where people can find a bit more information basically around that data. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth me just briefly saying that um, as part of the resources that you'll get after the call, I'll include an edited version of the chat. And if there's any unanswered questions, I'll try and answer them in that text document that you'll get. So um, if, if something hasn't been dealt with, then um, look out for that. Um, Alex, on the, on the data. Uh, yeah, on the data, so we are currently working through uh, releasing the essential digital skills data online. Um, so we're working with our uh, web teams at the moment to get that ready for uh, public consumption as soon as possible. Um, so that will be there, all the essential digital skills results for 2019 and 2020 broken down by almost every demographic that um, we have available to us. Um, so that's, that's one aspect. And then we have the regional fact sheets as well, which give you a bit of a regional breakdown as the name implies. Um, and, the, the report, of course, so all that available through the website, the data coming soon. So let me let me go back to sharing the screen and hope to answer some of the some of the questions people have come up with. So just to follow on from some of what we've been talking about about the, um, the COVID nineteen stuff specifically, there's some data on this in the report in the appendices, which we haven't mentioned, which I I found interesting. And yeah, even if there's no more public data available um, yet, right now you can access these appendices in the report. I'll show you the, the link shortly. So here there's 33% strongly agreeing that the, the pandemic has escalated the need for digital skills with a total of 78% agreeing with that statement. And um, Alex referred to the, the top line of this earlier, but do you agree that using technology has been a vital support? There's the breakdown there, which again, you see 38% strongly agree and a total of 80% agree with that statement. There's also some questions about what people have been doing. So um, do you agree that you've used technology more than usual? This is the one that Alex pulled out the headline from of 37%, 11% strongly agree, and then 26 tenths to agree. But you've also got this one about um, which if any of the following skills have been important to you. So video chat and social media you can see has been the most important, but also buying products and services, banking online, and understanding how to stay safe online also all get high proportions. So there's further questions on this in the report laid out in this, in this way. So if you want to access the report in full, um, the link's included in the slide so you can do that. It's, um, if you search for Consumer Digital Index 2020, you'll get this page, just nice simple button to download the, the PDF report. 
just to give you a brief overview of the contents. Um, Alex has talked about some of the content, but there's a huge amount in the report um, that goes into the digital engagement side of things, into people's attitudes and ambitions, their motivation, the things that are blocking them from being online, and some specific information about managing money online, as you'd expect from Lloyd's. There's also the Lloyd's Bank Academy. I, I don't think Gemma has been able to join us on the call. It's probably worth just shouting out now at this point in case she has. I don't think she has. So um, the Lloyd's Bank Academy includes lots of sort of digital upskilling um, resources around um, things particularly relevant to building an online presence for a business or designing websites, those sorts of things, but all sorts of um, other aspects of digital skills too. Someone asked if the 2017 digital exclusion heat map has been updated. Um, we have actually been in some conversations um, with the research team behind that and others about how that might happen soon. In the meantime, we've produced our own age and digital exclusion risk map, which works in a pretty different way, really. It doesn't enable you to see different levels of risk across England. But if you want to zoom into your local area, it can give you a bit of an indication of some um, in some insight into digital exclusion through a different method, which is um, more based on transactional data. So we were interested in GP surgeries, particularly because of COVID and because data is available about how many people at each surgery are registered for online services. So this map shows each GP surgery as a circle. The size of the circle is re related to the number of people registered at that surgery. The colour of the circle is related to how um, old the population of that surgery is, the people who are registered at that surgery. And this is calculated with a bit of an algorithm that particularly weights the oldest people. So it's, it's um, if there are more people who are over 80 or over 90, it gets more and more purple. And then finally, there's a, a pink circle around all of the dots on the screen, which indicates that they are places where less than 30% of the patients were registered for an online service in February 2020. You can also turn on blue circled dots for the remaining surgeries where more than 30% were, were registered. Uh, it's important that there's caveats around that which are explained on the website, but basically just because um, under 30% were registered doesn't mean the remaining population are all digitally excluded. They might be perfectly capable of doing things digitally but prefer to register at least until February by walking into the surgery or phoning up. But it gives us some idea of where there's potentially more risk or potentially people who at least weren't regularly using online services before COVID and might need more help doing so at the moment. We've produced a page of coronavirus support resources, which is on our website, which is all sorts of things to help you stay in touch with family, friends or colleagues or to help you help other people. And I noticed there were some questions about privacy and security in the, in the chat today. And there is now a section on that on this resources page. And we also have a, a slightly different framing of some of the same information oriented more towards helping someone take their first steps online that might even be suitable for for people who are doing so. One of our partners is Digital Unite and they help to train people to be what we call digital champions, people who help people with their digital skills. They have free access to their digital champions network which provides that training at the moment. They also have guides for doing that kind of work remotely which is something we've talked about a lot in these previous sessions. And they have access to lots of guides and resources around specific things that people might want to do online at the moment. And next session is on that topic of privacy, security and safeguarding during doing remote digital skills support. So please register to access that. You can do so via the citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events page where we also have the, the recordings of the previous events. I hope that that's covered quite a few of those questions. Um, one other thing that I know came up was the cost of being online. Um, Alex referred to, to that in the survey work. Um, I'm not sure I've got the, the slide today, but we do like to um, highlight the BT Basic offer whenever we can. It's a restrictive system. Um, it's not available to everyone, but if you are on certain benefits, including universal credit, if it is, um, 
zero income based universal credit. So if you're getting work, universal credit and you're not in work, um, then you can access a cheaper broadband offer from BT and a cheaper phone offer. Um, off the top of my head, it's £10 a month rather than, as Alex said, the average of 30 to 35. You get 15 gigabytes of data and you get some other fairly, fairly decent things. Obviously, £10 a month for someone who's on one of those benefits is still a really significant amount of money. So it's not necessarily that affordable, but you can help them. A related question that came up, um, someone mentioned that um, universal credit is a digital by default benefit. So yes, most people do need to apply online for it. There is limited um, option to apply for it through a phone service, but it's, it's based on what happens at local job centers and a very um, specific set of criteria about why you'd need to do that. So it's, it's worth saying that because you probably in your lives come across people who really can't do it online and you can signpost to them, them to the, the ways that they can still apply for the benefit. But it is something we talk about an awful lot as an example of a, a digital by default system that excludes the very people who are most likely to need it. Um, because we know they're the, the least likely to have digital skills. Um, I think that might be everything that we have time for. I'm kind of skimming through those questions now. Um, if you do have questions we haven't answered, as I say, I'll try and answer them in the, in the document that I'll send around that's an edited version of the chat. You're really welcome to, to email us and do have a look at the citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events page because lots of our previous sessions have, have touched on some of these, these issues. I hope that's helpful for everyone. Um, if there's something that's been particularly helpful for you today, it would be great if you could let us know about that in the chat and we'll bear it in mind for future. Um, and similarly, if there's something that we've missed, you've got a, a last little chance now to just mention that in the chat before you go and we'll try and deal with it. Otherwise, I'll wave goodbye. Thanks for coming.